Good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and call to order the uh, July 25th City Council meeting. Can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Clark? Here. Councilmember Morgan? Here. Councilmember Peterson? Here. Vice Mayor Brooks? Here. And Mayor Brown? Here. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any additions or deletions for tonight's agenda? Staff has no changes to the agenda this evening. Okay. We'll go on to item three, which is presentations, and we have a report from United Way on use of City of Capitola community grant funding. We have someone from the United Way with us this evening. Hi, welcome. Wonderful. Hello, my name is Milena Ranga. Um, I'm a community impact coordinator with Youth Action Network of United Way of Santa Cruz, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, to present about different programs that we have. Okay, so a little bit about Youth Action Network. Um, so Youth Action Network is a collaborative of both youth and adults working together to promote youth well-being, to po create positive community change, and to also elevate youth voices when it comes to decision making. Um, and as it pertains to the Children and Youth Bill of Rights, um, we really follow the different items in that by providing leadership opportunities, career building opportunities, access to mentors, and also offering stipends when it comes to youth giving their time volunteering. And the role of jurisdictional reps has been kind of a new implementation this past year. Um, and we've had really, really positive experiences. Um, jurisdictional reps, as you can see on the slides, were appointed and would work with young people not only to build connections through a meet and greet that was facilitated, but also to work together in co-designing and co-creating workshops that surround decision making within the community. Speaking of those workshops, one of our very successful workshops was Leaders Unite for Youth. At this workshop, we had 18 young people show up and 12 adult leaders. Youth were able to learn about policymaking at a city, county, and statewide level and have conversations with a bunch of different leaders. Um, young people were also able to register to vote, which was a really awesome thing that we were able to secure with the support of the county clerk. Some feedback that we got from young people at this event was that young people reported feeling like they were more connected to adults within the community. Not only that, but they also said that they felt like they understood decision-making processes more after this workshop. Um, youth also expressed wanting to learn more about the Children and Youth Bill of Rights and wanting to know how it can move forward within our community, um, specifically about leadership opportunities and career development. Um, youth also reported that they just wanted to have more events like this, where they had the opportunity to connect with leaders in the community. And Yan's role in the conversation. So we kind of wear many hats. Um, it's not only, you know, helping, working with different organizations to secure youth to be at these events and enjoy these opportunities, but it's also about having those network opportunities with adults throughout the community um, of different jurisdictions. It was actually at one of Yan's events or Yan's meetings of jurisdictional representatives where Capitola was able to, um, with the with a gracious thanks of Yvette, able to um, implement the youth liaison position within the Children and Youth Bill of Rights. And that was in a conversation that was facilitated, you know, within all of those leaders coming together. Um, and Yan also connects decision makers directly with youth leaders. Um, which helps their voices become much more heard, gives them validation, and also just promotes better community well-being. Um, and as you'll, we'll be, I'll be sharing more of, um, with the youth liaison position, we are hoping to formalize youth voice. Um, a youth liaison ensures that the city upholds the Children and Youth Bill of Rights by offering opportunities for leadership, providing compensation for youth's time, fostering mentorship, and also building that community between both adults and youth. Yeah, that's everything. If you want to stay connected to us, here's our website, our Instagram, our Facebook. 
These are the two coordinators. And I will also be sitting down and have my business cards um, if anybody wants to ask any questions. And yeah, that's everything. Thank you so much. Any questions from council? Comments? Questions? Comments? Thank you so much. This Wonderful. is a, exciting work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. All right. We were going to move on now to item four. It's a report on closed session. The city council met on the two items listed on the closed se session agenda and took no reportable action. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to additional materials. It looks like we have a number of additional materials this evening. Staff received 17 emails related to item 9C after publication of the agenda packet. And for item 9E, five emails were received after publication of the agenda packet. All materials are available online for public review and uh, in the back of the room in the hard copy agenda packet for review. Thank you. We'll go now to oral communications by members of the public. This is an opportunity for the public to address the council on any items that are not on tonight's agenda. Uh, you'll have up to three minutes. If you would like your name recorded in the minutes, please speak it into the microphone. Hi, welcome. Hi. Twelve reasons why vaccines are the problem, not the solution, was a presentation by author Leon Canarod whose second edition of his book, The Unfortunate Truth About Vaccines, Exposing the Vaccine Orthodoxy, is just out this month. You can order it through thevaccinemyth.com, and you'll get to the second edition via Amazon. And just uh, a little excerpt here. When something's happening, I always ask, why is this happening and who benefits? So this is part six. The pharmaceutical industry's influence on governmental agencies, the medical community, politicians, and the news media. If you tell a big enough lie and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it, unquote. Joseph Goebbels, Nazi minister of propaganda. Another quote, we now know that government by organized money is as dangerous as government by an organized mob. Franklin D. Roosevelt, last quote, our government is the best that money can buy, Mark Twain. Introduction. The influence of money in politics is nothing new. We have seen it with the tobacco industry, the military industrial complex, the nuclear industry, the oil cartels, the biotech industry pushing genetically modified foods, and now the attempt to push through the 5G technology in spite of dire warnings regarding electromagnetic field radiation. Therefore, it should not come as any surprise that the pharmaceutical industry has used its financial wealth to influence politicians, the CDC, FDA, AMA, AAP, the medical community in general, and the mainstream news media. Big Pharma's influence on society can hardly be overstated. It is the most profitable industry in the world. Big problem. And even the Supreme Court states vaccines are unavoidably unsafe. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi, my name is Goran Klopic. I'm a uh, Swiss citizen, a Schweizer Army veteran, Swiss Army veteran. I want to commemorate that I lost a good friend of mine uh, many years ago. <laughs> His name was uh, Damon Gutzwiller. Uh, there is a commemoration uh, at the park. I played with him uh, pickleball and I saw his wife cry at the ceremony. 
I just want to let you about that, how things got messed up. Uh, we lost a very good man. Thank you very much for listening. God bless you. Thank you, Goran. Hi, welcome. Hi. Hi, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council member, members. Um, my name is Melinda Orbach. So just in the past month, we've had two close calls on the intersection of Claire's and Capitola Road. My family and I often bike or walk from our home to Brown's Ranch to do grocery shopping, cut our hair, support the local businesses. And just, you know, an hour ago, my husband came back with my son um, and they were on a bike. My son was on the bike with my husband. Um, and he said, you know, as he was turning from Claire's to Capitola Road, there was a van that blazed past and almost hit him. So pedestrian safety is really important. Um, that, you know, Capitola Road is really busy, especially during the high traffic times. We've had neighbors with the same issues. A, a good friend of ours live off of Heritage Road and they have two small daughters and they've had many close calls as well. So I would love for the council to maybe set aside some existing resources, maybe have police presence there to ticket and generate more revenue for the city. Um, but there need to, needs to be some type of deterrent, either flashing signs for pedestrians or, you know, a speed, um, uh, uh, a flashing speed light. I, I think um, uh, I would love to see you consider something like that for the residents on that side of town. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi, my name is Keith Yehalen, and um, it's been brought to my attention by some other citizens of Capitola that apparently there was an event this last uh, a week ago in, down in the village, and we've had, uh, you, you guys have recently extended, as well as you remodeled the, uh, the, the event uh, department within the city, and yet, um, from what I've been told, all secondhand, but we can verify it, I'm sure, um, the bottom line is, at this event, there was... Um, unmonitored liquor that was sitting on a table that anyone could walk by. Um, apparently, there was no requirement for a police um, um, participation in the permit. And also, there was no um, designation of who the RBS person was for this event. So I think the city should um, have an investigation on how this was allowed to occur and uh, to provide a report to the public on how they're going to prevent it in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment this evening? Okay, seeing none, we will bring it back to, oh. Good evening, sir, welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council, City Manager and staff. My name is Mike Termini, and first I want to apologize for coming back before another five years went by. I promise you that the last time, sorry, you can't trust an old politician. Um, I came, first of all, to thank you for putting this new tax measure on the ballot. It was well-crafted. I think you're careful stewards with our tax money, evidenced by what you did with Measure F. Um, and I support it wholeheartedly, and thank you very much. And I am I'm endorsing it and in full favor of it. Thank you. Thank you. Don't be a stranger. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, we will move on now to staff and city council comments. Does staff have any comments this evening? I do have one thing I want to bring everyone's attention to. Next Wednesday, we will be doing a Wednesday night concert. We will also be celebrating the 75th anniversary of the city. So everyone is welcome. We're going to have um, staff out there with some information about the city. And in addition, we'll have free cake. So look forward to seeing folks. <laughs> All right, uh, any further staff comments? Seeing none, we'll go now to council. Do we have any city council comments? Yeah, council member Clark. I can one up the cake, I think. Uh, Tuesday, August 6th, it'll be national night out. You can all come out and have a hot dog with uh, Chief Daly. And uh, the police department will be out there and there'll be a lot of great activities. It'll be at Jade Street Park on August 6th. Uh, it's five to seven, don't miss it. Great, thank you. 
Yeah, I just want to put it out there that this Sunday is our annual Wharf to Wharf race. Um, the Wharf to Wharf brings in a ton of people into our tiny town, so just want to be mindful. Uh, a lot of the roads will be closed, um, and it is a fun event. So if you're down and you want to cheer on some people, me included, um, we would love that. So support uh, Wharf to Wharf. They've done a lot of things for our local wharf <laughs> and um so yeah just come on out and participate thanks thank you Coleman? Coleman? yeah vice mayor brooks thank you um i want to say thank you to chief uh daly for sending council information regarding the um the golf carts uh i'd love for staff to bring back at a later date at the convenience of time um what works best for you more information on that and perhaps a work plan that would um, that would work for the city of Capitola. Thank you. All right. Okay, we'll move on now to our consent agenda. Uh, all of these items will be enacted by one motion on the form listed below on the agenda, unless a council member wants to remove any item for further consideration and discussion. I'd like to move the consent agendas uh, items 8A, through F, please. I'll second it. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Carries unanimously. All right. That brings us to the regular business of the evening, and we'll start with item 9A, which is our youth liaison program. Turn it over to Chloe. Hi, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, this evening began with a lovely presentation from Melena, who is here with us from United Way, um, more specifically from YAN, the Youth Action Network. So I just want to highlight her, and also uh, we have Sarah Emmert, I believe, attending via Zoom, who I've been working with on this um, collaborative effort, so thank you. We'll be speaking about the Youth Liaison Program. Um, just as a preview, we are asking this evening and recommending that you authorize our city manager to execute a memorandum of understanding that formalizes this partnership for the program and officially allocates $1,300 to the program. Um, that, will, that money will serve as stipends for the students and hopefully nominate two city council members, one or two, to serve as mentors for these youth. So I'm gonna cut the background short because we had such a wonderful presentation on what um, Yan does through the United Way, but just as a, as a reminder, council did adopt the Children and Youth Bill of Rights last year, which is wonderful, um, really showing how you value the voice of our youth in, in this community and in Capitola. And as one of your goals for this fiscal year, you did highlight um, more than $1,300 for youth enrichment, but that $1,300 specifically for participating in this program. So moving on, um, the program's specific goals. This is a really exciting kind of, I believe, first of its kind effort in our greater community, but more specifically for Capitola. The program is for high school age students to directly participate and learn more about local municipal government. Really great. Um, it will ensure and hopefully encourage the youth perspective to the decisions that you make every day as our leaders. So the format here, uh, there, there's applications online directly with United Way for our youth to apply directly. And the selection of these um, liaisons, we're meeting in August to discuss in more detail uh, staff here and with Yan, but we'll select those, um, those youth, and then the liaisons will meet monthly with their council member mentor, attend council meetings at the conclusion of the program, so near the end of the school year, they'll present to council on their experience, and really from there, you know, more participation is up to the student um, themselves. And then as Melinda mentioned, they will receive a stipend to um, honor the time that they're spending in this way. And that will come directly from United Way, but is why we're recommending the allocation of funding. So that all being said, I believe um, there's more. <laughs> what will council members do? So hopefully you'll be the mentors. So there is a time commitment. You'll meet monthly with the liaison. Uh, for safety, we'll submit to a live scan, so fingerprinting, and also following the United Way's working with youth policies 
uh, just to be sure that we're putting our youth in um, safe hands. So that's the ask of yourselves. And I believe now, hopefully, you can nominate um, your members amongst yourselves. Let me know who is interested in this program and also um, authorize the city manager for the MOU and for the funding. If you have any questions, I'm here, Sarah's here, and Melinda's here. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll start with questions and then we'll go to public comment and come back for discussion. Any questions? Any questions? No? All right, we will open this item up to public comment. Is there any member of the public that would like to comment on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council. Um, this is exciting. This is an exciting expansion of our student seats on boards and commissions. This is just like the next level of engagement for youth. I'm really excited about it. Um, let's make sure that those who are currently in our student seats are aware of this opportunity if they're eligible. Absolutely. Um, yeah, any comments? Discussion? Comments or discussion? No? Okay. Um, well, then in that case, we need to choose two council members to participate as mentors. Anyone interested? Why, why wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you to our mayor for bringing on Youth Voices a few, was it a few years ago? And so this is just a continuation of ins ensuring that there's um, youth participation and um, education around the work that all of us get to do. Um, so I sit as the Youth Action Network uh, representative. I'm happy to continue um, mentoring uh, youth. I'd love for another council member to do that as well, um, if any of you would be so willing to throw your name in. I'm just going to join you, too. I could happily sit, step back if the two of you want to. This is our future, so I, I'd love to be on it. <laughs> All right. All right. It sounds like we have Vice Mayor Brooks and Council Member Clark. Thank you both. That's a really exciting opportunity for these young people to, to be mentored by you both. Does Council Member Morgan, I can step aside. Okay. okay. There you go. Oh, I feel sick all of a sudden. You might need to step <laughs> in. <laughs> no, okay, thank you. All right. Um, with that, we will entertain a motion for the remaining uh, recommended action. Can you put it back up on the screen for anyone who would like to make a motion? I'll move to authorize the city manager to execute a memorandum of understanding with the United Way Santa Cruz County for the county city of Capitola's participation in the youth liaison program and nominate council member Clark and council member Brooks. All second. All right. We have a motion in the second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We are going to move on to item 9B, our police chief recruitment process. Who on staff am I turning to for this one? City Manager Goldstein. Yeah, Mayor and Council. First, I know this is a little bit awkward because we haven't said goodbye to Chief Daly yet. Uh, there's going to be many opportunities to say goodbye. We have a number of plans in the works. Uh, we will have opportunities to make him very embarrassed. So. Uh, <laughs> We, we do get that chance moving forward. Uh, what we are talking about, though, because Chief Daly has announced his retirement plans, is how we're going to find our next uh, police chief. So uh, in the department head compensation plan, the approval of a recruitment process uh, requires city council approval. It's my job to pr uh, propose a plan and appoint the chief and your job to approve the recruitment process. So in this case, I am recommending an internal recruitment for police chief. We have some terrific folks in our leadership team in the police department, I think will make a great, a great police chief for Capitola. So I'm recommending an internal recruitment. It's the first time I've ever recommended that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, our plan would be to do kind of a, a little bit of a sort of scaled back version of our recruitment process and interviewing process than we've done in the past. Still doing some checking in with our chief's advisory council, checking in with POA, staff, open the internal recruitment in August and September. Uh, and then we were looking to do two interview panels, having like a police chief panel, and then probably a community council staff person panel, and then looking to make the appointment probably towards the end of, end of October. So that is the plan. And what we would be looking for would be one to two council members to help serve on the interview panel, and then also approval or council has any tweaks to the recruitment process. 
And with that, I'm available for questions. Thank you. Questions? No questions? No? Okay. Um, we'll take this now to public comment. If there's any member of the public that would like to comment on this item, now is the time. Seeing none, we will bring it back to council. Um, so you said how many people were going to be on the panel? One to two. No, not how many council members, how oh. many people? TBD. Okay. Yeah. So TBD. up to two council members. So it'll, de I just haven't finalized the panels. Usually what we do is we have like a professional panel, usually comprised of maybe a POA representative and then a couple of our local chiefs. Hopefully Chief Daly might be able to fill in as well. And then we do kind of more of a community staff panel. So ballpark, we're thinking probably a couple, two, three department heads, couple, one, two council members, um, one or two community members. Okay. And you're, are you going to put the panel together? I am happy to get feedback if council has specific suggestions. No, I just, this is just for informational purposes. So that if members of the community ask me, I have answers. Got it. Um, okay. Discussion. Uh, go ahead. Council member clerk. Would, would there be a way for council to sit in both panels? One, maybe one on each meeting. We could, we have done that in the past where what we've done is we've ended up kind of splitting up the council members to have more than two participate. Um, my only hesitancy around that is, is that I often find the kind of the post interview debrief with all the panelists really valuable. You get to hear all everyone's different perspective and you obviously we can't do that with two council members from two different panels. But it's certainly um, given the recruitment process and internal recruitment process this time around, I think it's something that we could work with if, if council members really wanted to do that. I think it would be good for oversight. And big shoes to fill with Andy leaving, but it's a great process and I think we all should be involved with it. As many as we can. Uh, yeah, I I think um, maybe if when it comes to the community members that we're picking, maybe there could be some input or like what type of shoes want to be filled by those people. Um, and I would love to sit on a panel personally. I was able to do it when Chief Daly was interviewed. I interview people on the daily basis, so <laughs> it's uh, second nature to me. So I just want to. Put my hat in the ring. Questions or comments? I would just um, second what we've heard so far. Um, I would also like to be on the panel. I think it's a really important uh, role, obviously, for the city. Um, and I just want to make sure that we get a, a lot of diversity of the panels from community members as well. Yeah, absolutely. You might have to draw straws. I'd like to be on it also. Well, we could either draw straws or if there's a way to move forward with having three, I don't know, uh, Council Member Clark, if I'm volunteering you out of turn here, but you could also sit on the professionals yeah. panel and then have the other two council members on the council members panel. I don't know which one you would prefer to be on and I could leave that up to you guys to figure it out. But Yeah, I thought, that, I thought that's what um, Jamie and Council Member Clark were saying is that we could split up council members into the two groups. We could, So yes. we have a total of two in each if we wanted to, right? Yes. Yes. So that's fine. We can make that work if the council, if there's three council members that really like to do it. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, is that, it sounds like we've got general consensus on that. Okay. Okay. All right. Any further comments? Okay. All right. Uh, so then we need to move forward now with the recommended action, approve a police chief internal recruitment process and designate council member Peterson, council member Morgan, and council member Clark to serve on the interview panels. I will second that. I hadn't made a motion. I was suggesting that someone oh. should make a motion. <laughs> no, I was like, I'm surprised you're doing this right now. The mayor doesn't usually make motions. No, I don't. <laughs> I will let that be my motion then. <laughs> we will approve the police chief internal recruitment process and designate those three council members that were just stated. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Moving on, item 9C, dogs at city parks and Capitola Beach. And I will turn it over to Chief Daly. Hello. I am. Okay. Good evening, <clears throat> Mayor, Council, and staff. Uh, this evening, we're going to be talking about the uh, dog regulations in Capitola. <clears throat> uh, 
Next slide. I'll just give you a quick preview so we um, touch on this at the beginning and we'll circle back at the end. But um, there's options tonight. We can take no further action. I'll give you an overview of kind of everything that's where we can take dogs, can't take dogs. And then um, so you can take no action or we could identify potential changes to the current regulations that we have. Um, and we can also you can also direct staff to uh, maybe look at some other locations and then have us come back with maybe recommendations or um, further funding if we need to. So next slide. So uh, what we're going to cover tonight is where, where are dogs permitted in the city? Our current regulations are like our leash law. Um, the regulations currently on Capitola Beach and some of our surrounding jurisdictions. We'll talk about uh, Capitola Wharf and the current regulations. Uh, the current regulations around the parks, which change park to park. And then we'll give a staff recommendation and then give you some time to dis for discussion. Uh, so where are dogs permitted? So. In general, anywhere in the public space, uh, the leash law is what regulates dogs. They must be on a leash. A leash has, be, has to be six feet in length, and they have to be in control of the, of the animal. Um, that's kind of the default of any of those uh, any of the public places, so walking in the public. Um, that also includes Hen Park, uh, or Hennen Park, and then also the park at Rispin Mansion, because those are uh, pathways. There's really no um, areas, uh, so the pathway, they have to be on a leash. And then um, in our code specifically, uh, we have uh, areas where dogs are allowed. So that's where they're, they're permitted off on leash in, in certain parks. So those parks, the slide's a little bit off there, but Monterey Avenue Park, uh, dogs are allowed on leash. Uh, Noble Gulch Park, uh, Perry Park, Silk Hill Creek Park, Jade Street Park, there is some exceptions um, where they can't be on the tennis courts or in the lawn area. And then also Esplanade Park, they're not allowed on the lawn area, but they are allowed um, on leash. Next slide. Uh, so currently where dogs are not permitted, so right now dogs are not allowed on the beach uh, within the city of Capitola. Um, they're not allowed on Capitola Wharf and they're not allowed on um, any location that's posted with signage. And so the one area that, uh, that is posted no dogs is Cortez Park. That's a little neighborhood park in the, in the Explorer neighborhood. Um, Something to think about with Capitola Beach. So we are consistent with Santa Cruz Main Beach. They are not allowed to have dogs on the beach as well. Um, municipal beaches are a little bit different than maybe county beaches because we're very dense beaches. So Capitola Beach, you know, if, if you know, depending on the sand and the time of the year, uh, we have about 400 yards of shoreline, which consists of our main beach. We have Hooper's Beach, which is to the, the, um, the north side of the, the wharf, that little section there. And then we have kind of the low tide area that's between um, the Capitola Jetty and then New Brighton. So on a low tide, that kind of exposes beach there. On a high tide, there's no beach. Um, so our beach, uh, that's kind of, that's our area, but 400 yards of municipal beach that's very, um, it has a very high season. So we're very busy from May through October. Uh, we do have lifeguards on the beach. Um, again, we're consistent with Santa Cruz Main Beach. They're not, dogs are not allowed on that beach as well. And then we do receive uh, we do receive a lot of complaints about dogs on the beach. Um, this last year, and we've issued a, thirty citations for dogs um, dog violations throughout the city. Um, and then just to, just as a matter of um, you know access, accessibility, uh, the nearby beaches that do allow dogs on leash is New Brighton State Beach, and then also Moran Lake. So Twenty Sixth Avenue dogs are allowed, and that's a county beach uh, on leash. Um, Santa Cruz, City of Santa Cruz has designated um, dog beach like areas, but again, that's um, on the west side. I think Mitchell's Cove and then its beach um, has the regulations there. Um, and then one thing to consider is that any any type of change to um, coastal access may have to go back before Coastal Commission for a review. Um, so that's just something to consider. Um, so we'll wrap, kind of roll it right into the wharf regulations. Unfortunately, I didn't have a picture of our new, new wharf, but um, but uh, currently, we do not allow dogs on the on the wharf. Um, again, that's the same as Santa Cruz Wharf. Dogs are not allowed on the wharf on Santa Cruz. It just there's there's challenges there. It's a municipal wharf with a high concentration of people. Um, the railways make it a little bit closed in. Um, we also want to understand that, or you know, that the wharf plans to include fishing activities and also some food vendors. So understanding as we um, look at the access for, for dogs. Um, 
There is, there's concerns for dog waste plants uh, as far as dogs uh, urinating or defecating on the wharf and it goes into the ocean. Cleanups always, it can, be a, can be concerns as well. Um, and again, we're consistent with Santa Cruz uh, City um, with not allowing dogs on the wharf. And so next is parks, which, which gets a little bit more complicated because each park is a little bit different. So we'll kind of color code things so it makes it a little bit more palatable. Um, so in the green are all the parks where dogs are allowed on leash. Um, so the top one is the dog, Aussie Dog Park, which is obviously an enclosed dog park that has a small dog area and a large dog uh, run. Those are off-leash parks. Uh, Soquel Creek Park is allowed on-leash. Jade Street Park allowed on-leash. Understand that there's limitations with that. Esplanade Park on-leash except for the, the lawn. Uh, Monterey Avenue Park allowed uh, on-leash. And then Noble Gulch Park, Perry Park, and then again uh, with and in Park, Brisbane, and then the other parks that do not allow it currently. Next. Um, so Monterey Park and, and Jade Street Park have been topics of um, maybe looking at dog parks in those areas. Um, there's been some community um, outreach there. Um, essentially, the most recent discussions about Park, Monterey Park Avenue, um, there's always been challenges with the school um, because they have they own half of that. There's been um, uh, some pushback from organized sports programs, youth activities, and I believe um, in both the so both the Jade Street and the Monterey Avenue, uh, SoCal Unified has come out saying that they would prefer not to have dogs. Uh, next slide. Uh, so an area that. A possible location for, for maybe a, a future dog park. Uh, staff has located or identified Noble Gulch Park, which is down a little bit further down on uh, Monterey Avenue. Um, it's currently allowed on leash. Um, as we look at this site, we're looking at kind of that upper, or it's kind of the upper area that's a little bit further deeper into the, um, into the real narrow park there. Um, but it would require a muni code amendment, and then we would also suggest maybe a budget for, for fencing. Um, it, it does have kind of a natural, it, could, uh, it aligns with a, with a creek there, so maybe just one-sided fence. I'm not, I'm not sure we'd have to take a look at that. Um, and then I know we have, uh, I think, dog waste, but we don't have like a water station there, so if that's an option, some dog parks, you don't have to have it, but that's an option if you wanted to make it a more, uh, you know, a little bit better dog park. So that, that's, that's one option to move forward. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Um, some, some things, if you do try, decide to either uh, you know, change the code, um, our recommendations would, would be very clear and identifiable boundaries, so fencing or um, at very clear areas so people can understand where the dogs are allowed. So not just like a 40 by 40 area in the middle of the park. That's just really hard to kind of legally enforce um, and so we would be you would just make we would suggest that you have very clear clear and identifiable boundaries so anything uh, you know to the east side of the wharf or um, in a clearly identified area the other piece is that is we would suggest very clear park rules that are consistent with other parks so having like odd hours like the second Tuesday of every month between this time to that time it's just really hard for people to understand it's really hard to enforce and so it'll just becomes problematic. And then um, finally, as with any, um, it seems like any time we bring up dogs or, you know, there's, there's a lot of passion on each, each side. So just making sure that the, the proper public outreach is done um, in those impacted areas because it's going to impact them. And with that, we come back full circle to we can take no further action at this time or we can, you can identify potential changes to any of the current regulations, direct staff to return. Um, and with that, I think we're at a discussion. I'm open for any questions. All right. We'll start with questions. Any questions on this end? No. Any questions on this end? No. Okay. I have a question. Um, some of the concerns that have been brought towards uh, us are about liability and about dogs on or off leash and if that creates any liability for the city. I know we're not the only city that's ever had an off leash or considered an off leash dog area. How do other cities go about this, or do you know generally 
what would be required? Would signage alone be enough to release us from liability? Should there be an injury to a dog or an injury to a person from a dog or whatever the case may be? How would we handle something like that so that the city isn't liable should something happen? I, are you prepared? <laughs> I, pre um, I think signage would be a good first step. Um, I don't really have a detailed answer for you on this, but if that is the council's direction to sort of pursue a, an off-leash policy, we can certainly look into that issue and bring it back. I mean, just sort of anecdotally, I see signs all over the place that say, this is an off-leash area, pay attention. Um, but I, we don't, I'm not really prepared to get into a legal sure, analysis sure. right now off the top of my head. Okay, no, I, I appreciate that. Okay, um, I think that was the only question I have right now. So I'll save the rest for later discussion. Um, okay. Add something with that? Yes, please. Actually, um, one, I would just say that we, you would want to limit risk. So by putting a fence around something or putting, making sure that it's really clearly identifiable, I think that limits risk. So I, I would be concerned about putting um, an unleashed area right next to a really busy road or something like that because people throw balls or whatever. So I think just looking at the recommendations and, you know, fencing, having those amenities, we can take a look at it. But just looking at limiting that risk. But they sure. obviously off-leash parks are, are out there. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, speaking of that, I have how will this kind of impact, will this mainly impact the PD to sort of make sure that the regulations are being followed or is that going to be with REC or Public Works or how will that work? So enforcement, the police department would handle. And then we also, um, we have a contract with animal services. So they actually patrol all of our parks as well. And they issue citations. I didn't run their numbers, but our community service officers routinely patrol. And they, they do proactive patrols. Again, there's a lot of people that, that violate it. So, I mean, we've issued 30 citations, but I know there's a lot of violations that do happen. We warn a lot too. So, um, sorry. Um, the presentation mentioned that we got s several calls and concerns about dogs on the beach. Do we tend to get a number of calls about dog attacks? Uh, we do. I, I don't have the exact numbers, but it's not a frequent. I'm not aware of any like recent dog attack, but we do. We do get reports of like dog on dog. Um, and then those are reported. And so I, I could get you those numbers. I'm not aware that it's like a, a, a massive problem in any way, though. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? No? Okay. With that, we will bring this out to public comment. If you'd like to make a comment on this item, please approach the podium. You'll have up to three minutes. Please speak your, speak your name into the microphone if you would like it recorded in the minutes. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Karin Hanna. Um, I urge the council to keep the dog policy as it currently exists regarding the beach and wharf area. In the staff report, there are nine parks and public places dogs are allowed besides all sidewalk streets, lawn way, and the railroad right of way. There are three places where the dogs are not allowed. If the numbers were reversed, the dog owners might have a better uh, case. Um, several reasons, obvious reasons why dogs on the beach are a problem. The most obvious is sanitation. It's impossible to collect every bit of dog feces when it's in the sand and the air and just soaks in. And we know many owners will not be picking up after their dogs, especially if they're off leash and uh, locating the waste is almost impossible after it's covered with sand. That's why dog hours are not appropriate in Capitola. Even if it's early in the morning or in the winter, you're still going to have um, waste that's not collected. Many dog owners clean up after other dogs, but on the beach, you, you won't see it until you step in it or sit on it. Um, Capitol is a family beach. It gets pretty crowded. Uh, the usually gentle surf does not reach most of the beach and therefore doesn't clean the beach of dog waste. With so many children on the beach, what's bound to happen? Sand goes in the mouth of those children. Um, and along with it, dog waste. Um, what the surf does clean just puts the waste into the ocean, which we also don't want. Here's one of my pet peeves. Uh, many dog owners feel like their dog's urine is like fairy dust. It belongs everywhere. It enhances the environment, as witnessed by the puddles on the corners of most buildings in the village and all of the light poles. Uh, many of us business owners and employees are having to clean up dog feces from the sidewalks on a regular basis or risk of being tracked along the sidewalk. 
uh, making an unsightly mess. Um, I often ask dog owners why they let their dogs pee on other people's buildings and planter boxes, and the most co common response is, I can't control what he does, or it's just a little bit. Because you love your dog, everyone else should love it, and it's byproducts. If you change the policy, there'll just be more dogs pooping and peeing on their way to the beach. Uh, sanitation is obviously the reason dogs shouldn't be allowed on the wharf. Sidewalk can be pressure washed, and the city pays a lot to clean the sidewalks now. Um, there's no way to clean the wood on the wharf. No dogs. That's an absolute no-brainer. Um, I know this issue about the dogs on the beach was brought forward by a local youth, and while we're all happy to see uh, young people civ civically involved, it shouldn't be a factor in your decision in this case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Good evening, my name is Dave Montgomery, and I live in Capitola. I would like the City Council to seriously consider a 60-day pilot program for Monterey Avenue Park to allow dogs off the leash for a, in, the, in the early evening, whether it's an hour before sunset or 6 to 7 p.m., some, some designated time. Some of you may remember from two years ago, I was up here pitching this, and that, that proposal kind of got out of control into a park with fences, et cetera, that was, would be in conflict with the proposed renovations of New Brighton Middle School. So I'm back just asking for an hour before sunset or, like I said, an enforceable period, like 6 to 7 p.m. Um, I think this would be the lowest cost to City Capitola. It would be only signage that would need to be changed there. And I have met with Scott Turnbull, the superintendent of the the yeah, superintendent of the district that manages New Brighton Middle School, and I heard his concerns about dogs being off leash in Monterey Park, and I believe they're unfounded from the point of view that this would not make that problem any worse or truthfully any better. I mean, the irresponsible dog owners of today are going to be there tomorrow. So uh, a, a group of that a group that I'm part of that allow our dogs to go to Monterey Park, we're very uh, responsibly clean up after our dogs and other dogs. And so I, I really encourage the council to look at a possible pilot program to see if this could work out. Just to, as three of you that were here two years ago uh, have already heard, this started out during COVID uh, as a way to get us out of our houses and get some fresh air. And we would walk our dogs over to Monterey Park just because we were all going crazy being locked down. And it has evolved to a very tight-knit group of friends who actually have like, brought me meals when I was recovering from surgery, and I brought other people's meals recovering from surgery. We're all in the local neighborhood, and it's been quite remarkable what a, a fairly tight-knit group of friends uh, we've all become. So again, I would like the council to seriously consider a pilot program for Monterey Avenue Park for this one hour in the early evening to allow our dogs to be off leash. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's, I hate to do this, folks, but we got to make sure that we are um, equally accommodating to all of our speakers. So in the same way that we wouldn't allow booing or hissing, I'm going to ask that we maintain our clapping to a minimum as well. All right, Evening. welcome. My name is Maura Matera. I live in Capitola. Nobody will be applauding my presentation. <laughs> Years ago, when my children were little, I lived on 26th Avenue, and we went to 26th Avenue Beach all the time. I got bitten, my kids got bitten, my kids got scratched. It was a terrible, terrible idea to have these doggies on the beach. I don't need to point out that 26th Avenue Beach is a far different beach from Capitola. 26th Avenue has pounding surf, carried presumably away the deposits that the dogs left on the beach. And also there was some room to spread out. So I'm sure that many people here were on, at Capitola Beach on um, 4th of July and they did not see the sand because there were just umbrellas and beach towels. We have a very crowded beach here. This is just a really bad idea and I certainly urge everyone to look at the safety of both dogs and people. Thank you. 
Thank you. Hi, welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and staff. Um, my name is Marilyn Mortar, and I live in Capitola. And basically, I agree with what Dave said about um, a pilot program in Monterey Park. I think that would be great. But I have two questions, um, mostly of the police chief. I've been told by staff that it's okay to have your dog off leash on the left of the jetty. Is that true? Because if not, I shouldn't be doing it anymore. <laughs> I, I, I would say that that's kind of an inner circle of Okay. Okay. Okay, good to know. Okay, I get it. I get it. Thank you. And the other thing is, um, I remember when the city council bought Monterey Park from the Mormon Church in back in the eighties, because I'm old. And I think you said that that the school district owns half of the park. I don't ever remember the city selling half of the park. To, I know the the school district owns on the other side of the berm and that's their area, but Monterey Park is fully owned by the city of Capitola. Am I right? Okay, great, thank you so much. Thank you. I was nodding my head at that, I was correct, right? Okay, good, thank you, just making sure. Hi, my name is Jill Hi, Landis, and I live in the city of Capitola, and uh, I'm here with the group of friends that um, have formed around the dogs at the park. The dogs are a social lubricant, uh, they also have, it can cause issues. Um, my dog has personally been attacked in the city three times by another dog uh, and required some serious socialization from the trauma. And it happened with the group at Monterey Park. She, she learned to be around dogs again, and I really appreciate that. I also really appreciate the city council and people coming out to talk about it because it's all our city and we have to share it. Um, the Aussie Park seems like the obvious solution, but I've, I've had three dogs that I've taken to that park and none of them would, would move. They would just kind of stand there. And I don't know if it's the bark. I don't know if it's the skate park next to it and the sound, but it, there's something very um, different about that park. And at Monterey Park, we walk. We tend, most of us here that are in support of the off-leash period, we walk to the park, we're neighbors. And we do try to be very conscientious. And I know there was an issue with the school as far as, as dog waste. And that's, I can tell you that is not us. I mean, there may be other people causing that problem, but we are all watching out and we all are taking care of the mess and I clean up after other dogs all the time. Anyway, that I'm, I'm with Dave. I really support a, an off-leash period, not a giant park or anything like that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi, good evening. Um, Madam Mayor, uh, council members, staff, Chief Daly, uh, my name is Richard Lippi. Uh, I live on Monterey Avenue, and I have the uh, dubious distinction of my house being the closest to the property line of Monterey Park. I'm right there, and my living room looks out on Monterey Park, and I can't see all of it, but I can see most of it. And uh, it was a great blessing during the um, shutdown uh, where we had to uh, shelter in place because I felt I could still socialize because I could just sit on my living room couch and see people out at the park. And since the pandemic, um, there has been a group out there I call the core group of off-leashers. Um, it's five to 10 people, five to 10 dogs normally. They arrive around five o'clock and they leave around six or seven. And uh, my observation is that they're uh, very hospitable. Uh, the dogs know each other and get along. The people get along, they have a great time. But in my opinion, I think that there are some serious unintended consequences of this action. And I really consider myself um, a law-abiding citizen. I, I always try to do the right thing. Uh, I pick up litter, 
Uh, I stop at stop signs when there's nobody at the intersection. When I go shopping, I bring shopping carts into the store instead of, instead of leaving them in the, in the parking space. And I was a volunteer with the uh, Capitol Police Department for, for six years. So I have a real appreciation, I think, for the good service that the police department does. And they really shouldn't be taking time out of their schedule to, uh, w to monitor off-leash activities. One of the big unintended consequences of this is that, sure, these people, are, they know each other and they're organized, but it's a, it's a big public display of disregard for the leash law, and other people pick up on that. And I have seen that. I have seen the increase of people coming with off-leash dogs when the, when the core group is not there. And it starts half hour before sunrise, and it goes to an hour after sunset. There's people interspersed in there. And that's, you know, when you've got this public display of disregard for the law, it, it just leads to more disrespect. Um, the, also, um, I've seen that, uh, and I, I don't know if the kids are picking it up, but I've seen uh, misuse and disregard of Monterey Park and by, by the kids on e-bikes. They use it as a motocross track. And I don't know if they're saying to themselves, well, if the adults can you know, dis disregard the law, I can too. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi. Hello, I'm John Fox. I live in Capitola. It's great to, um, to be here. Um, I moved to Capitola 16 months ago from Berkeley. And um, one thing you do when you move to a new place is you try to find a community, you know, people around you. So one thing that has helped me the most is to get a puppy. And this is Elrond, my puppy. So, and I met these people at Monterey Park and they're fantastic and welcoming. And, you know, off-leash dog areas build community. They really do. Um, it's, uh, it's much different than just walking your dog on a leash because you don't interact with the dog owners that much. But, you know, there's a community that builds around this. So, um, and I don't see any. Oh, yeah. The... Okay, we go. got it. Okay, my fault. Um, I don't see a harm in the 60-day pilot program. Let's just see how it goes. Um, you know, is something sanctioned, something that, uh, you know, we can evaluate. Um, I had not heard of the idea to have no, um, Nobel Gulch Park um, as a dog park, a legal dog park there. And I don't know the details, but right now I'm pretty interested in that as well. But um, Ozzy's is really not accessible by walking. And it's also not very hospitable to the dogs, I hate to say. Right next to a skate park, I have another dog that's a Yorkshire Terrier who barks at skateboards. So it's, um, and it's hard to get to. You know, this is, um, you know, something that's more central, very friendly, and um, that we can work in partnership with. So um, I have a lot of time left, but I'll yield it to the next speaker. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Hi, welcome. I'm an also local resident and a, uh, almost a daily violator over the last five or six years <laughs> to the Monterey Park dog leash. Um, I'd like to say, take a little bit different tack, however. I, I don't know whether it was Gandhi or the Communist Manifesto who talked about the greatest good for the greatest number. Uh, but we have a beautiful park there that lies empty for the most part of the day. Um, yes, there's a little bit of use, and yes, there are people who use the track, and yes, the sports teams use it. Um, but speaking as a violator, uh, we have tried to accommodate ourselves in and around all these scheduled events uh, and try to be very considerate of them. Um, I think a pilot program couldn't hurt to see how it would work. Uh, if anything, it might create a magnet for all the dog poop that's over in the schoolyard and come back over to Monterey Park where it could be a take, taken care of in a little smaller density, smaller area, excuse me. Um, I think there could be many benefits and there have been made some assumptions of what would happen if we did this thing. This would happen and there would be more of this and it would be detrimental to that. We don't know that unless we find out. Um, I think the benefits, the personal benefits from the stories of the people are, are obvious, but that doesn't make it a reason for you folks to take any action. 
But I do think as a, as a Capitola park that serves the citizens of Capitola and the obvious demand for such a thing, otherwise we wouldn't be scofflawing. There wouldn't be so many of us all day long, everywhere. It seems a pilot program would then see how it works for 60 days and see if there are any ill effects. And if they're not, you cancel it. And if so, I can give my time back to somebody else. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Not as tall as he is. Um, let's see. Hi, um, my name is Hajin Kamalani. I also am a resident of uh, the city of Capitola. Um, I have two children who went through New Brighton Middle School. I also served on the board of the Little League, Capitola uh, SoCal Little League, and I also happen to be a physician. So I'll kind of be coming at this from all different angles, but I do you know, see the concerns of all the schools, the police officers, who thank you for all the work you guys do, and um, you as well. And one of the things I'd like to say is we don't want to go to the beach. We don't want to poop on there. So let's just right off the bat take that off because it, we don't want to, you know, it's crowded for all the reasons stated before. Um, and to the gentleman who says, you yeah, know, we're breaking laws and it's showing other people that we're doing this. Well, that's why we're here. We want to do this in a lawful manner. We want to talk about it and have a discourse about it where we can come to some agreement. Yeah. So, um, like I said, one of the reasons why we started gathering, and I, as a, from a physician center point, I want to actually talk about um, the health benefits of having a sort of communal. This is really about community. I just want to ask everybody um, from our little off-leash cartel, could you all raise your hands? So this is one group that's here who have, two years ago, I did not know any of these people. You know, I'm going to get a little tearful. Um, I have vertigo, and it is completely debilitating. I cannot walk that far. I cannot go down trails that are difficult. I cannot drive far. A lot of these other people have similar medical conditions where they've had recent knee replacement, they've had shoulder replacement, whatever it is, breast cancer, chemotherapy. Some people are elderly as we all mostly look, we're probably of, we're not the youthful group, though I do say my daughter and my uh, son regularly come and we do have younger members as well, which also speaks to community. How are we going to have these interactions, right? I brought you, brought you a bunch of articles, which I am going to submit as whatever evidence or whatever you guys want to call it. But these are because this is kind of my background. Um, Harvard Medical School, um, Harvard Health actually has a brochure that they, <laughs> I giggled when I found this. Um, it literally is uh, about how to get, get healthy, get a dog, you know, and it talks about the benefits of having a dog. Not only are we keeping fit, blah, blah, blah. It's actually the American Heart Association has uh, recently put out a report in two, 2022 that says just by having dogs, you decrease your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your risk for cardiovascular disease. And these are not just the effects of having big, just from the act of walking the dog, which also basically gives people structure. Um, even walking a dog 30 minutes a day will decrease your, not just your cardiovascular disease risk, but osteoporosis, breast cancer, type 2 diabetes. I could go on about that stuff. Oh, I'm already cut off. Can I take somebody else's time really quickly? <laughs> I'm sorry. No? Thank okay. you for your comments, but uh, you're welcome to leave uh, your materials okay. with our city. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi, thank you. My name is Lisa Steingroup, and thank you for listening to us, and I'll try to keep it brief so I don't reiterate, but obviously I support the pilot program. We live right across the street, and my dog waits at the window for me to go break a law and walk him <laughs> off leash, and he looks at me, looks at the park, looks at me, and we're mindful of Chad's hard job it is to keep enforcing, and and we just want a chance to see if this pilot program will work. And if it, if it becomes a problem for the school district, then we're willing, you know, to make adjustments. We just want a chance. And we are other citizens. Um, I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought. We created a community of friends at Monterey Park, both human and dog buddies and would like to be allowed with the city's blessing instead of being, you know, like Rich, I'm pretty law-abiding most of the time. But that's, 
you know, my dog is where I draw the line, I guess. But um, many new products and services and programs were created by giving people a chance. And we just want that chance. And if we get unexpected or unacceptable outcomes, at least we feel heard. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. My name is Charlotte Morrison. I'm also a resident of Capitola. Um, yeah, I'm here to support Dave's idea of the 60-day pilot program just to see what, you know, if it can work. It seems like a reasonable ask, definitely. Uh, also, I would say that, you know, the number of uh, scofflaws here plus the number of citations and warnings to me is indicative that something needs to change. So we would appreciate your consideration on that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kevin Bransfield, and I'm also in support of Dave's idea for a pilot program. And I have a condition that's called ankylosing spondylitis. And so my backbone is slowly fusing together. And it makes it hard to sometimes walk or even drive to someplace like Ozzy Park. And so Monterey Park's become a real godsend as I've raised my dog. And if you don't take a dog off leash and have it play with other dogs, it doesn't really socialize. Does everybody remember uh, that person, hyperactive Philip on SNL? who is tied off to the playground. <laughs> that's, that's what your dog becomes. And I can't tire her out uh, the way she tires herself out when she plays with other dogs. So we have a lot of dogs here in town. It feels like it's, it's good to find solutions. I thank you all for doing this. And, um, and when I talk to people from other towns, some, some towns have like beautiful parks for dogs and, and a lot of different options, you know, even like kind of country clubs next to the water where your dog can run around as you have a drink. And I looked up um, dog-friendly towns in California, and what I saw was Carmel, Monterey, and even Santa Cruz. And I'd really like us all to put Capitola on the map. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're friends. You're Monterey Dog Park. <laughs> You're welcome to accompany her to the podium. Oh, sure. I may be an interloper because I'm actually a resident of Soquel. Um, my name is Kathy McDonald. I don't know if I'm even allowed to be here for that matter, but I am one of the um, people who really enjoys um, going to Monterey Avenue Park with my dogs over the years. And I do want to make it clear for those of you who are talking about um, the beaches. We're not here to talk about the beaches. I don't take my dog to Capitola Beach or to the wharf. I would never do that. It's too crowded, for one thing. We don't want them running around off leash. They need their own little grassy field, which is um, exactly what Monterey Park does for us. I would also agree that every time I've ever attempted to take any of my dogs over the years to these so-called dog parks, like Aussie Park or the other one in Aptos, the dogs don't play. They just stand there. They don't know what to do with all this bark and it stinks and I don't know what happens in their heads. So I'm really big on the idea of doing the pilot program and I want to just make one comment about the concept. This is a community park and we are the community. And so I really would like us to see how we could make some room for those of us who don't have human children, we have dog children. And I pay my taxes. I'm an otherwise, you know, I own a business. I'm a law-abiding citizen. I just want my dog to have one hour a day of playtime. And through that, we have built this amazing community of friends. So I will, I'd like to just conclude by saying that. Sorry, um, I'm back again. We, we only allow each speaker three minutes, and unfortunately, you can't yield your time to another speaker. My apologies. It's just not fair for others in the room to not be able to speak more than three minutes when they don't have someone who can yield their time to them. I just want to second the no baby. Okay. Because I think we heard your, ma'am, we heard your comments. Thank you. We appreciate it. 
Hi, welcome. Hi, um, I'm Susanna Sarasvati. I um, live in the Jewel Box. I'm in Jade Park regularly. And although I'm not in Monterey Park as often, I would also agree with this idea of giving them a pilot program. I'm currently dogless because my retriever up and died after 15 years. But um, when he was alive, we would do a lot of training exercises and we like to do agility and you, you need a lawn area and you need the dog off leash to take your props and do your things. And just because a dog is on a leash doesn't mean it's under control. We have a lot of human anchors out there on the end of a dog leash that are totally oblivious <laughs> to what their dog is doing. And if the dog's leaving droppings, they don't see it. And if you call their attention to it, they get belligerent and aggressive with you. They're getting belligerent with the wrong person, but you know, it's, um, and I'm also one of the people that picks up other people's dogs droppings because I see it at the park. Yeah, we have a sanitation problem at Jade Park, but it's not from the dogs. It's from the used condoms and drug paraphernalia that you find on the bleachers and under the bleachers and behind the bathroom buildings. Um, I think other people have complained about that too. So. Dogs are part of the family. Let's give them a place where they can run off leash and socialize. And the people that usually are going to parks to have their dog that way are usually a community that will look after people who are misbehaving in the park or at least try to encourage them. And if anything, can we try and maybe encourage people to be better dog guardians? Kind of help people understand that if you're out there with your dog, it don't just say dogs must be on leash. Dogs must be on leash, comma, and under control. <laughs> because some people don't get the idea, hey, my dog's on a leash. Well, yeah, but you're not controlling it. I was once attacked by a dog that dragged his owner on the leash down and bit me and bit my dog. I had to pay for the stitches of that dog because my dog defended himself. We were in our own yard, but my dog was not on a leash. So somehow that made me responsible for the out of control dog that dragged his owner down the street over into my yard. So just keep in mind, leash doesn't cure everything and dogs <coughs> do need a place. So let's try a pilot program. It works in Monterey Park, let's extend it to Jade Park. I'm there regularly. The holes you see there aren't from the domestic dogs, it's from the coyotes hunting the gophers. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Del Grande, and I'm a resident of Capitola. I'd like to uh, discuss Jollyman Park in Cupertino. It was one of the parks that I fought for to support, and we abided uh, e every evening. Um, the same, you know. Now that I'm a resident here, we um, we feel the same uh, kind of the encouragement as a community to uh, advocate again. Jollyman Park was uh, prohibited. This is a Cupertino, and, and eventually they made it. And you're, I'm sure you're aware of. Anyway, they have opened. It's been successful the past, I think, the past five years. Um, and I'm a resident here over 10 years. And it's an hour before sunset. And it was it is a success. It is a wonderful community. And I feel very um, honored to have been a part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Just Hi. before you start, anyone else who's interested in making a comment on this item, can you raise your hand? Okay. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you, Mayor and Council people, for allowing us to share our voice here. My name is Josie Mello. My husband, Joe, is here, and we're residents. This is my dog, Rui. He is, we're on the corner of Monterey and Eleanor, and he's a neighborhood greeter. And I am very grateful uh, to this group. Marilyn, who worked with my husband years and years ago, I happened to be walking Rui on leash at the park, and she came up to me and said, hi, you know, want to introduce you to our group of friends. And I was really grateful for that because um, we were new to the community. I didn't know anyone. And I was just walking my dog alone. And because of that, I've met tremendous new friends, very supportive friends. My husband also went through chemotherapy treatment. The group has been very supportive of us, and we have done the same. 
we've been able to support one another through life journey. I did send you a letter because the uh, um, <clears throat> benefits are far greater than just, you know, this group that has their dogs run around. We're very supportive of one another. I've worked with seniors for 20 years, and it's very important. I'm a senior. Most of the group are seniors, and they need to be with people. They, they don't need to be isolated. They need to be out talking to people. Have a, a lot of them don't have children. They don't have people local. They don't have anyone that they can, you know, turn to in times of need. And we're there for one another. So it, it, it's a wonderful community. It is a community park. We are very law-abiding citizens. I have not gone and broken the rule because I'm afraid. I mean, we've been really threatened, and that's very scary to me. And, you know, we just want to have a place that our dog can play, and it's different when they're off leash, there's a beautiful um, place in San Francisco called Funston Fort, and all dogs are off leash, and it is wonderful. They're, they're happy, they're you know running together, and you should come and see it. You will just smile to see these dogs. It is such a wonderful, joyful feeling to see all the people communicating and, and socializing together, and all the dogs. I mean, people see the group, they, they just smile. So I would like you to consider this one, one hour, it's one hour where people can continue this wonderful relationship of building community together and have the dog, um, you know, not you know, wanting to bite our legs off when they get home because they didn't have their playtime. So thank you for considering our proposal for one hour. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Um, I've lived across the street from the park for too long. I was there before it was a park. And I appreciate the energy you put into looking at uh, the gulch down at the end of the road there. But three people can park there, and that's just not feasible. It's a good idea, but there's no parking there. And like the others have indicated, uh, we're not about the beaches or anything like that because that's not a good fit. But uh, as my wife will attest, Lisa, I'm not the most social person in the world. So we've got this little dog. He's about 15 pounds. He thinks he, uh, he, thinks he owns the place. And... He took me over there, drugged me over there, and I let him loose with these other dogs. And what I've learned is this dog interaction is so cool. It can bring tears to your eyes. The way when they see each other, it's like, boom. I mean, they greet each other when they come over to the park. It's a beautiful thing to see. And yes, I've I've grown to like the people, too. <laughs> anyway, I, I want to keep it short, but you get what we're saying. And um, consideration of an hour would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Um, as a Capitol resident, um, my first point is, um, and I just bring up a procedural issue. It's why is this issue being brought to the council and the public? And stuff. I'd like to in the future have the council at least put on the minutes or in the initial presentation why we're even discussing this topic, which has been has been brought up before. Okay, and I kind of think that's interesting. Why that's a, this is an election year, um, but number two, for everyone that's lived in Capitola for more than a few years, they know this this passionate issue was addressed multiple years ago, and the council came to a decision. And to quote Mr. Tremini as he left uh, this evening, he said. Um, I'm leaving, I've seen this, done this. So he didn't want to jump in the middle of that again. Um, but, you know, I'll agree. I, I personally, I grew up with dogs. Um, I, I fondly remember my time with my two dogs down in the western Kansas pasture and, and laying on the ground and watching them play and looking up at the sky. And I totally agree with all the social and medical benefits that come from dogs. Um, but I just have to stand with the decision that this council made multiple years ago and oppose it. Thank you. Any further comments? Okay. Seeing none, we will bring it back. Oh, we'll bring it back to council. 
Uh, I first want to address, because I think it's a, a worthy question, this is being discussed right now because one of my fellow council members asked that it be on the agenda. Uh, council members at any council meeting can request that an item come back to council for consideration at a future meeting, and so that's where this particular item comes from. Um, okay, we are back to council deliberation, discussion, uh, votes. I'll start at this end. Council member Clark. Just a couple of comments. Um, I'm a, I'm a two-dog person. I enjoy dogs. They really do make a difference in everyone's life. Um, so it's great that it brings the community together. I think we should have a, a trial period, but not at Monterey Park. I think Noble Goats would be a better place. Um, there are There is parking right across the street and quite a bit of it. And in that area, there's not the school, there's not the sports. Um, and I think we would be able to put in a better enclosure for off-leash dogs to make it safe for everybody. So I think Noble Gulch would be an excellent idea for a trial period. Maybe the staff could uh, look at how much uh, the cost may, may be um, and give the people that live by Noble Gulch an opportunity to, to speak about it also, but I think that would be a great location. Thank you. Council Member Morgan? Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming out and speaking your stories and giving us all your anecdotal fun things. I am definitely a dog lover. I've seen many of you out and about with my dog. Um, she unfortunately can't hang out with others off leash. But um, so I totally get uh, where everybody is coming from. Um, I, I do want to second th that I feel that normal gulch is very close by it is walkable there is some parking and then we do have the um spaces across the street in the city lot um and i feel like it's a place that could be sectioned off it would really alleviate i think for the pd to not have to regulate that hour if it's enclosed you can go any time of day if we figure out a good system with good fencing make it safe um my dog wouldn't like aussies either the skateboards everything like that is not her jam um and I believe in each and every one of you for picking up the remnants, um, but you get one bad egg in the group and it really ruins it for everybody. So I, I don't want to see that happen to this hour, to this pilot program. Um, I think that in conjunction with the city, we want to maintain good relationship with our school. So we don't really want to go against what uh, Mr. Turnbull has said um, and for the children. Um, maybe we need to look into the e-bike situation, track pump scene that's happening over there um so i think that um i think that i really want to try this uh, i am glad that it has come back to us i think noble gulch was brought up the last time we discussed this i've always thought it was a good spot it's um pretty central location anybody if you're coming from soquel coming from the beach area you can easily access it um so that's kind of where my um where I am aligning with, I would, I would like to see staff come back with some info on how we can get that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Peterson? Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, I want to really thank everybody for coming out and expressing their concerns and their needs. I'm also a dog owner. Um, do live in that general area. We walk our dog over to Monterey Park um, a lot and have seen some of you over there before. Um, Everything or most of what has been said here, I do agree with a lot, and I'm not going to bother reiterating too much of it. But I will say um, something that I believe that wasn't brought up very much is that not all dogs are safe to be in the same area as children. And as much as my own dog and the vast majority of dogs are that I've interacted with, there are some dogs um, that I have seen who are aggressive, and I wouldn't feel comfortable having an off-leash dog park without fencing in an area that children play, personally. Um, I do think Noble Gulch is an amazing opportunity. It's right down the street. It has one of the most abundant parking spaces in the city right next to it, the lots right here. Um, and I think we could have a huge, amazing dog park McGregor Dog Park isn't a great park for dogs. I don't know why my dog doesn't like it either. I don't really like it. It may be the wood chips. I would rethink that if we're going to build a new dog park. Um, 
but yeah, I would definitely love to, um, for staff to come back with some possibilities for a dog park at Noble Gulch. I think we could have a really large dog park there in the back area that could be, you know, within walkable distance from basically anybody in the Monterey uh, area neighborhood. I would also like to see um, dogs allowed at the Cortez Park and the Jade Street lawn area. I don't see any good reason for on-leash dogs not to be allowed in those areas. And also, I would personally be fine with dogs being allowed off-leash in the low tide area between Capitola Beach and New Brighton, but I'm not very passionate about that one way or the other. I would like to see dogs allowed there. I think Capitola Beach is too busy, too crowded, I get it. But that area, it's kind of accepted as an off-leash dog park as it is. I don't see any problem with that. And thank you. Yes, Vice Mayor Brooks. Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers coming, um, coming tonight to share their thoughts. Um, we received numerous emails about different asks. Um, so I, I appreciate Council Member Peterson bringing all of them up. I am um, not in favor of having open or beat dogs on the beaches at all. Um, I think aligning on leash dogs at Cortez is fair. It's just something I think, I think we might've had a hiccup there with on leash. Um, that we, I don't, I don't know why we don't have that. There's currently a water, uh, dog, can, dogs, uh, watering thing so they can drink water there. So it's a little ironic. Um, there are, um, I, I, I'm hearing council say two different things. So I, I'd like to, to get some more information on this. Um, I, I know that our community here this evening is looking for off leash time. And I'm curious whether Noble Gulch is, if council is thinking about the off leash time at Noble Gulch and that 60 day pilot program effect, uh, taking effect now, the only concern I have is that there's really no measurements of success. So how do we know if off-leash is working? We don't, I don't think we have anything um, set. And I'm curious whether when Mr. Montgomery spoke a couple years ago with staff, um, if there was any information on measurements of success for an off-leash time, or is it council's um, direction, Because so just for clarity, where there's no off-leash, but we're looking for fencing in Noble Gulch. So I'm just looking for clarity. My thoughts were, was the fact that if we did fence it, it would be off leash at any point in time. It, well, not when it's dark. Like the park closes at whatever the dark, park. right? So <laughs> time change and all that. But um, yeah, that was my intention. I don't know if you want to clarify. Yeah, exactly. It would be more like Ozzy's Park. There's an actual enclosure. You can have the dogs off leash anytime. The park's open. Okay. As much as I wish we can leave well enough alone and that you all could carry on doing what you're doing, which sounds like it's tremendous out there. Um, I, I agree that we can look at some fencing in Noble Gulch. Um, I live in the community as well and I'm a dog owner. Um, and so I think it's important to have space. My dog too does not like that area with the tan <laughs> bark. I've tried, it does not work at Aussie. So I think that we should look into that actually. Um, so. I would be in favor of looking at fencing in Noble Gulch. Um, I'd also like for Mr. Montgomery to continue the conversation with staff on like what that vision looks like and what's like space look like for a dog. If we're only gonna put a five by five fence line, you know, that's not really what this community is asking for. It's asking for open space for our, our pups. Um, so I'd love for Mr. Montgomery to continue conversations with staff around what that could look like and really with this group um, could benefit from if as we move forward with this. Well, if I could speak to that, based on what I'm hearing, I've heard some conversations about Noble Gulch, and then I've heard conversations about the back area of Noble Gulch. And what we've heard today is that a number of people who are enjoying their off-leash time with their animals would have difficulty in kind of getting down into a space. Um, my understanding or my preference would be is that if we're moving to this to Mo Mo Noble Gulch, that it would be the entire park, the whole thing. Is that? I'm 
okay Perfect. with that. You're okay with that? Yeah, I don't. I think Noble Gulch is incredibly underutilized, and it would it be is. packed full of people if we did that. Yeah, I would agree with that. Underutilized for sure. However, I would still like to see an enclosure, even yes. even if they're yes. allowed to go throughout the park. Some people might not feel comfortable about having their dog off a leash with that. Yeah, that's too close to the, to the street yeah, without I, a fence. I would like to, I don't mind expanding the area and bringing it closer to the sidewalk or to have more accessibility, but on that corner, I mean, me just walking the dog, I've been hit, or yeah. not been hit, <laughs> almost hit. <laughs> and I'm fine. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I've, you know, seen a lot of weird traffic stuff there, so I would also still want people who, I do see people eating lunch there and stuff that don't have dogs. So a space that is still a little bit available for those that aren't utilizing it for their dogs. I would like to see how, how that would look, but I'm fine expanding the area for sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I guess I'll make, I'll make my comments. Um, I I'm outnumbered here. So originally, um, you know, I think sometimes we get confused when we start talking about the dogs in Monterey Park and if people are picking up after them or not and if there's kids around. And it kind of occurred to me, dogs are already allowed in Monterey Park. All we're really discussing is whether or not we're going to allow them off leash. Um, and, you know, I was prepared to move forward with the 60-day trial period of off leash um, in, in the before sunset kind of time. Um, but it sounds like I'm outnumbered here. So I'm going to jump on board with the Noble Gulch idea. If we can extend it to the entire park and have it fenced in, um, I think that that's going to be a good opportunity for people to continue to have a better space than the Aussie dog park for off-leash dog um, opportunities. I'm also thinking... Oh, yeah, I guess that's it. I guess the only other thing is, you know... We, we've heard a lot about the dogs on the beach, and I, I think it's been made pretty clear that people aren't really interested in having dogs on Capitola Beach. At some point, you know, there's always, this always comes up. This has come up like every couple of years for the last eight years that I've been on council. When I worked in the village, my concern was people would come in and tell me that they left their dogs in the car because they found out that they weren't allowed to bring them on the beach or to any of the stores. And that is incredibly concerning to me. And so if there are any businesses that are dog daycares out there that are looking to open up shop, we have several open shop spaces in the village. And I highly encourage them to come here because we need safe spaces for our dogs, um, especially for people who are coming here as, as visitors and tourists and might not know better until they get here. The last thing I want is to find out that someone left their dog in a hot car because they couldn't take it on the beach. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Um, really excited about the expansion idea for one. Uh, but I just wanted to, for one, I have one other comment that I think that dog waste is a concern in areas where dogs are allowed on leash or off leash. I'd love to see those little dog waste stations with the bat free bags. I think that would be really helpful to people. Um, and then also I just wanted to get some possible feedback from the rest of the council on it sounded like if that said no during low tide in that area between New Brighton and Capitola. Um, and I didn't hear anything from anybody else about um, Page Street Park on the grass for on leash dogs. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I would uh, disagree with Page Street Park. And the reason why is that field is used 24 7 if we had lights, but soccer all the time on the grass area. The other area they're not allowed is the baseball field for obvious reasons because they play baseball in there. So that although the dogs can go in there, they just can't be on those certain areas. So you okay. can't have a dog on Jade Street. You just can't be in the grass areas. Okay. Well, I would still feel like it's a giant win to get a huge dog park at Noble Gulch and dogs on leash at Cortez. So I wouldn't argue with if we got those. Okay. Um, any further comments? Yeah, no, I'm in consensus that we can, and I don't know if we need this as a motion or if you want to bring it back, or the mayor can ask if we need to see the plans come back on what Noble Gulch would look like and after more input from the community. Um, and money, where Yeah, we need a budget allocation, right? <laughs> All of those great things. So I, I think maybe just direction today is what, rather than an action item. Yeah, if I could just, I think I have direction. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page because oftentimes we People can hear different things at the same time. What I'm hearing is the council say that they're interested in the Noble Gulch option. 
maybe not just the upper part, maybe some portion or all, kind of look for maybe some natural divides through the grassy area, come back with a cost, what that would take, and also notice it to the neighbors in that area and bring that back to a hearing. Do you want to do the same for Cortez Park or it's really just a sign change? So there's limited sort of fiscal impacts. If this, if this Cortez is just a sign change, I think we just changed the sign. We can just do that because that was the one spot that Chief Daly went through that that side, that's the one site in the city that has just a sign that's posted. It's not in the Municom. Um, Maybe some bag stations there and other places. Maybe that could come back as along with Noble Gulch. Yeah, sure. We can take a look at that. I think we, yes. There is one. We have a note to look at where the bag stations are and we can kind of take a look and make sure we have them. I don't know if it needs to be a council heavy discussion item. There, there is one at Noble Gulch. Yeah, there is. I see um, a doggy donor wall in our future. A doggy donor wall? I mean, if we want the best park, let's go. I, w I was just going to add that um, I just want to be clear to our community that we'll see how much it costs, um, but we are also in the middle of um, a, you know, our sales tax measure and, and looking at deficit spending. So just being mindful of that. <laughs> wah, 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 sorry. So I think the next steps then is essentially we're going to ask staff to come back to us with plans for turning Noble Gulch Park into a, fence, a fenced-in area to allow off-leash dogs and what the cost would be to do that along with a water station and a bag station in that area. Am I yep. understanding correctly? We already have a bag thing that will maybe expand and oh, sure. we'll walk okay. into all kind of all the different elements of what a dog park might cost and you know we can take a look and see what we think we can afford okay. or fundraise for. And a fundraise for there we go. I would just add, I think the the wood chips aren't good. I think it creates a sterile environment. And for whatever reason, I think my dog really just loves nature. And when it seems like it's, you know, sterile, same color, same dead stuff everywhere, I think that's a big part of the reason why the park at McGregor is very underused. Yeah. Maybe we can fill it with sand and the dogs will feel like they're on the beach. Maybe. Yeah. Solve the beach problem. <laughs> Done. <laughs> All right. Um, so we don't need a vote on this one. We just got staff direction. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out tonight and giving your, your input on this. We really appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, we're going to do a, we'll do a, a two-minute, two, two or three-minute uh, break, and we will convene moment very brief presentation at which point I'll turn it over to the appointed subcommittee who drafted the argument in favor of the ballot measure. Uh, tonight our recommended action is to adopt a resolution adopting the argument in favor of the city's ballot measure, releasing the right to draft the rebuttal argument to identified individuals and amending section 6 of resolution 4385 regarding the submission deadline. In addition, we'll be making a very small technical correction to the resolution as it appears in the agenda packet tonight to address a numbering issue in the sections. For background, on June 27th, the City Council adopted a resolution and appointed Vice Mayor Brooks and Councilmember Clark as a subcommittee to draft the ballot argument in support of the City's sales tax measure. Santa Cruz County has established the following deadlines for submission of the argument at the time of our last agenda packet. The deadline was based on the elections code requirement. The Santa Cruz County Elections Department has adopted a deadline in advance of that requirement, which is what necessitates the change to our resolution this evening. So the deadline for the argument is August 13th, and at this point I will turn it over to Vice Mayor Brooks and Councilmember Clark to present the argument language. Thank you. Um, so council received the argument in our packets already. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. That's why you saw my hand raised earlier if you were curious. I was trying to tee this up. Um, so council member Clark and I went ahead and drafted this argument in favor of the ballot um, measure. And I am open. We are open to any feedback or questions about it. Um, just note that there is, we are limited by characters and how many words we can essentially have on it. Um, so if there's any questions, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you both for taking your time to put this together. 
Do we have any, uh, do you want to explain why it says measure dash, just in case anyone um, might be wondering? So it looks like somebody got into my ballot argument um, when I sent it. So I think there was some like little um, typos there. No, but no, I mean down at the bottom where it says vote yes oh, and measure oh, blank. Oh, to yes. Expect why that is. So why you see, I was like, no, it looks like I just pushed a button. Um, so as of today, we have not been assigned a letter. So generally speaking, when you see something on the ballot, it says vote for measure F. Um, we will not be assigned a letter until August 9th by the county clerk. Um, so until then, we will, or until we receive one, is that's when they'll update this for us. Um, from I also want to note, I want to thank uh, the community members who have already stepped up in support of this, um, who have been working on um, on supporting the sales tax measure already. Um, you'll also note that we anticipate, they anticipate um, what they've shared with me to have a website um, and some e uh, other things in relation to, to the sales tax. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions? Questions? No? Okay. All right. We will take this out to the public. If there's any public comment on this item, now is the time. Welcome. Uh, Jerry Jensen. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, i just like to publicly speak about total support of the tax measure that we see in front of us tonight. Um, I think it's uh, an amazing thing um, when we look at um, some of the things that we funded, bringing our employees up to um, an average medium of salary so they can to keep working here I think is very important and also provide some additional funding for other things in the community that will be noted. Um, I have attended some other public meetings and I've said publicly before and I would like to just reinstate it um, even though it won't be directly, directly connected I encourage to have some sort of a, um, a, an oversight committee that I've made up of some community members so um, you know so that there's some guidance or um, uh, information that can be passed on to the council uh, for some direction on how some of those projects could look in the future. Um, when I shared that with um, our city manager, um, one of the great ideas was, you know, not just having another committee, but maybe expanding a committee, like maybe the fact committee, and maybe they can be, play a little bit more, that can be expanded a little bit by a couple other members, and maybe that can have more of an advisement role on looking at projects and or other future things, and just as in an advisory role, providing some community input to the council. So with that, again, um, Look forward. I'm volunteering on the committee to make sure that this measure passes and um, it helps provide for that funding that we need. And uh, look forward to working with everybody on that. So thank you. Thank you. Any further comment on this item? Hi, welcome. Hi again. Um, I also support this measure, and I think um, balancing our books is important. I know in anticipation of the expiration of, of Measure F, the city will have an issue with budgeting. And this is just for the current services that we are providing in terms of public safety, the city staff. And in order to really prioritize some of these projects that we want to move forward, like the dog park, um, we will need funding. We will need funding. So I 100% support, support this measure. I will be out uh, canvassing for this, and I am also part of the committee to volunteer and spread the word. Um, thank you for your work on this. Thank you. Any further public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to council. So my understanding is we, um, well, we'll have some discussion, but I understand we need to adopt a resolution uh, adopting the argument in favor. We need to release the right to draft the rebuttal argument in favor of the city's transaction and use tax measure. You can speak to it? Okay, I'm gonna hand it off to you because you've been doing more on this than I have. <laughs> no. okay. um, so uh, I'll share with uh, council that I've reached out to Mr. Peter Wilk, um, who has graciously accepted um, the task of having the rebuttal released to him. So what that means is if there was opposition to this sales tax, then as a community member, Mr. Wilk um, would write somewhat similar to this um, ballot argument, a response to um, our, yeah, ballot argument, a response to a rebuttal. Um, this is a community effort, so Mr. Wilk would 
reach out to the committee. Um, you've met two of the, the members today and uh, collect signatures uh, should this happen. Uh, of course, we hope this, that does not happen and, um, and I anticipate that it'll all be great. So um, I'm putting all that out there in the universe. So that, that's next steps and um, I, if Mr. Wilk, I don't know if Mr. Wilk wants to say anything or. Would you like to make any comments? No, oh, fair enough. We we appreciate your uh, your your time and willingness to participate in this way. Um, I think that was a great choice, Mr. Walk, being our former city treasurer and current planning commissioner, is um, well informed of the needs of the city and our financial status and needs and the importance of this. So that's a, a great choice, and thank you again. All right. Any further discussion? I'd like to say thanks to the vice mayor. She was the major author on this. I think I had one word changed, <laughs> but I appreciate everything you did. And also our, our, our public members and uh, our, one of our past mayors who was helpful in, in getting this going. It is really going to take the whole community to make sure we see this pass. So yeah. I'm glad that we're doing it and then let's, let's get to work. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to those that have stepped up to help us get this going and all the word of mouth that we can um, get this off the ground will be so, so helpful to our community that we all love dearly. And thank you to my fellow members up here for putting in some hours. Um, and I would like to make a motion uh, to adopt a resolution adopting the argument in favor of the city's transaction. Oh yeah, sorry. Transactions and use tax measure placed on the ballot by resolution number 4385, releasing the right to draft the rebuttal argument in favor of the city's transactions and use tax measure to identified individuals and amending section six of resolution 4385 regarding the deadline for submission of arguments for and against the city's transactions and use tax measure. To Mr. Wilk, thank you. I'd like to second it. All right, we have a motion and a second. I will just quickly echo uh, the thanks to Vice Mayor Brooks and Council Member Clark, to all the committee members um, that are working really hard on this. Really excited um, to move this forward. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Great. Good work, team. We're going to move on to item 9E, Ordinance Amending Capital Municipal, Municipal Code, Section 2.04.275. Turn it over to Jim. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, so this next item before you, as we just mentioned, is City Council compensation. So I'll start off with a little bit of background. Um, the way that this the council compensation works is that the uh, state sets from time to time sets like a base and then you're allowed to do uh, inflationary adjustments but those adjustments can only go up to five percent and they can only go into effect following the election so you could bump you know adjust the salary each year but it would only become effective following an election if that makes sense so this uh first slide up here gives you the um kind of the history of city council compensation, which was originally established in 1966 at $75. Um, I believe in the 70s, the base, the state changed the base to 150, and at some point the city went to the 150. Um, in the 80s, they changed the base, and then from each time they changed the base, you can go from that base with the same CPI or 5%. Um, in the 1984, I believe, they changed it to $300 per month, and uh, Capitola followed suit by adjusting the salary in 1991. Um, it didn't get amended again for 15 years, and then it was changed to $500. Um, I, I didn't do the calc, but that could have gone up probably significantly more than that or slightly more. Um, in September of 2019, was uh, we revisited, it had been 13 years, so we took a look at the um, salary the calculation at the time, the, it could have, have gone from $500 up to $990. It went to the back, and they decided on a $600 a month salary, but to re revisit on a regular basis so that it stays a little more caught up with inflation rather than waiting you know, 10 to 15 years to see an adjustment. 
So the last adjustment was during 2022, prior to the 2022 election. It went up 5% each year from 600 to 660. And um, so now here we are. This is the next two-year cycle. However, this year, um, on January 1st, there was a new um, Senate bill passed, Senate Bill 329, which, thank you, which increased, changed the base from 300, which was set in 1984, up to the 950 per month. Um, just to give you some perspective, $300 in 1984 is worth about $900 in 2024, depending on where in 1984 you lived and where you compare it to, to now, but it's about $900. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And the intent of Senate Bill 329 was really to help keep city councils more diverse by allowing individuals across different income levels to serve and support their families. Um, one thing I'll say right here, in the past when we've looked at this, we've done a lot of comparables with other cities in the region and across the state. We didn't really look at it, the comparables this time, because with the law changing, we don't really know who's going to change, who's not, who's going to wait till the next election cycle. So it was a little more challenging to get an apples to apples comparison with not knowing what other jurisdictions are going to do. Um, another way to look at it is if a city council member spends about 40 hours a month in meetings and conducting city business, um, 950 a month breaks out to about 2375 per hour to just kind of put it in context if you're looking at it at an trying to get to an hourly rate. And then um, if if the council adjusted the compensation from six to the current rate of 660 to 950, that comes out to about $18,000 annually, 9,000 in the first year. There are no benefits. This is this is salary. There are, are no really benefits. It's just your compensation other than a little PARS contribution. And then um, looking at city council as compensation compared to total payroll across the city, it's less than half a percent and remains less than half a percent with just this change to the bill into effect. Next slide. Uh, we did talk about this at the Finance Advisory Committee um, during our May 21st meeting and had a pretty good conversation. Uh, Mayor Brown was not at that meeting and Vice Mayor Brooks participated in the conversation but um, abstained from voting. I'd also point out that we've appointed two fact members since that meeting, um, Matt Arthur and Anthony Lobarco. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, they were appointed after this meeting, so they were not present during that meeting or during the discussion or part of the recommendation. Um, but the fact did, after that conversation um, with the three members that were there, unanimously vote to approve increasing council compensation to 950. Again, that wouldn't go into effect until following the November election, generally in early December when it's certified. Um, again, fiscal impact, 18,000 annually, 9,000 the first year. And then also to continue the annual reviews with the intent of doing the adjustments more on a regular basis so that we don't go these long periods of time and then when we do adjustments, there are much bigger increases on a percentage basis than what you would do if you were doing each year and keeping up with inflation. Next slide, please. I think that is it. That's the end of my presentation. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, Vice Mayor Brooks, do you have a question? Thanks, Jim, for the presentation. Um, I can understand op how optically this looks. It's poorly timed. Um, however, I appreciate the slide on that the staff and the fact we're following the timeline already established by council in, pre uh, in the previous year. So I just want that to be clear. Um, my question about it is, and maybe it's for Tamar, um, if could this increase be contingent on um, if the sales tax measure were to pass or not? Yes, absolutely. It would require um, us to read in some language to amend a section of the ordinance as it was written or as it was posted in the agenda, but we could certainly do that. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Questions? Questions? No? Okay. All right. Uh, we will bring this to public comment. If there's any member of the public that would like to comment on this item, now is the time. Hi, welcome. Uh, good, good evening again. I'm Jerry Jensen. Um, just talking about this, um, I totally understand with the new change uh, with the state law, um, understanding about getting more in, uh, involvement and stuff from um, different 
diversity and, you know, um, having more inclusion and have more people involved, which I think is extremely important. I just think, um, as Council Member, Council Member Brooks was saying, um, timing and optics around this, around the sales tax measure that we're looking at is um, extremely concerning to myself um, and I think to a lot of other people I've talked to. Um, also, the optics of, if you look at it just from a percentage standpoint, I think it's approximately 43% increase. Um, and when we look at um, the average of salary, I think that was just increased right now by the staff that I think is in the MOUs is approximately three to four percent. And so just have a concern around that as we go forward. Also, looking back, if we went back to 2019 and over a five year period, I think the average would be about a 58 percent raise uh, for the council. So um, just we want to be sensitive to that as our value employees, as we look at what their cost is. Um, and maybe even look at this is something that could be phased in at a little bit different rate. Um, I know um, in the MOUs I, um, I've been reading on that are in council packets, there's different, uh, there was a wage study that was done that um, would reflect different pay raises for different people um, to make sure that they're all brought in within a medium. And maybe the same exact thing could be done um, with some research from other, some other cities on what they plan on doing either now. Um, I do know. Um, some just quick checks, um, you know, the rates are a little bit different than what they are right now, even under what the 660 is right now, but maybe looking at to find out what they plan on doing, you know, are they proposing for a measure, um, you know, or after the election process, are they going to raise them, but doing a comparability study so that we can look back at the employee groups and say that everybody's trying to treat fairly and equitably across the city. So I appreciate that um, comments to be heard, and I did write a letter that, um, I think you all received it. I don't need to read that, but it can just be for the record. So thanks again for your time. Have a good night. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hello again, Karen Hanna. Um, I've spoken on this issue every almost every time the increases come up. This one. The, the optics just suck, and uh, um, I mean, I, I just I agree with everything that Jerry said. Um, it, there's just no there's just no look good look about this. And if you just go with the five percent that you are able to raise, it's you know five years from now you'll be at the nine hundred dollars. I don't think in reality. I don't think that the compensation is what drives people to serve on the city council. I don't think any of you people said, ooh, I can make, well, at the time, it was five or $600 more a month, and uh, even $900. If you're living in Capitola, and you're involved in the community, and you're already, um, you're probably vo uh, volunteering, I, I spend a lot more than 40 hours a month in the, on my volunteer work, a lot more. And I, I wouldn't consider having to be paid to do something like this. I have a whole big long speech. I'm not even, I'm not even reading it. Um, I agree with that the, the timing with the sales tax is terrible. I think you should wait and see. I mean, Watsonville, Scotts Valley, much bigger cities, much more complicated. I've done this job. It's not that difficult. And if you really are, you know, involved in the community, you're not doing it for the money. So the optics just suck. And believe me, it's going to come back. So wait a year. The next people who get elected, do the 5% now. Wait a year. See what other, other areas do and make that decision with the new people that get elected on the city council. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Welcome. Hello, um, Mayor, City Council members, uh, City staff. Um, it was great seeing uh, Mike Termini here tonight. I still think he's the uh, Capitola Mayor. No disrespect to anyone else here, but he, he's kind of the man. And you know what I loved about him is we could always have discussions and debates and agree to disagree. And uh, I did agree with one thing. You can't always trust a politician and all run at that. But uh, secondly, I'd have to disagree on the whole major F. I don't, honestly, I don't think that um, it was spent um, in the way that those of, who, those of us who voted for it thought it was going to be spent. Um, that being three and a half million towards the wharf, 
Um, I do know some of them went towards law enforcement. Um, but um, in the latest, latest uh, budget report, um, the city manager stated that it's going to have to use a rest and major rep to make ends meet because our um, expenditures are outgrowing our revenue. So um, while the optics is one thing, especially with trying to pass a new major rep, honestly, I don't even, I don't even, I would hope, I agree with Karin, that people who are setting up for your job, you're not here for the money. I would hope that was the case because that's not what this is about. It's a public service job. So that's one. Two, um, Scotts Valley gets 500. They're not asking for more. They don't have any intent of asking for more. So yeah, the state allows it, but they're not asking for more. Um, Watsonville, I think it's 580, which is a twice the size of uh, our little town. So um, I would think uh, when you pay our city staff uh, commensurate with Scotts Valley, or you want to say, I think you're going to be 47% above uh, Scotts Valley's payment if you gave yourself this raise, then maybe consider coming back and, and uh, giving yourself a raise. But I think we would put our city staff ahead of us, or you as council members, um, pay them commensurate, which I think we're way below uh, the medium for um, Scotts Valley and definitely Watsonville, and then consider this raise. Um, this new major F, I'm, I'm torn. You, you kind of have us in a bind here because I love our employees. I want them to get a raise that they deserve. I personally don't think it should be tied to a tax measure. I think it should have come out of our, our general fund. We've passed major O. Don't know where that money went. It, it was supposed to be for roads, uh, emergency reserves, which I understand we're up to speed now, but um, our roads are a disaster. We're not putting money in there from major O. Um, major F wasn't spent on the wharf. We have no restaurant, no buildings. And the rest of the money is going to be spent towards balancing the budget. So I would ask that you forego the raise. And once we get our city employees paid appropriately, then come back and, and take a look at it. Thank you. Thank you. We can agree that Mike will be the forever mayor. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Council, Matt Arthur. I was just appointed to the um, Finance mm -hmm. Advisory Committee. And when I saw this coming up, it was recommended or um, recommended by the uh, Finance Advisory Committee. Well, I thought now my name's tied to it, so I wanted to dig in and investigate what was going on. So um, I know you guys like to compare cities to cities to cities to cities. As I understood at this meeting on the 21st in May, there were no comparisons given. So I think there's some comparisons uh, that were given tonight. Um, Watsonville has a population of 52,000, covers about a little over seven square miles. Um, Scotts Valley, 12,000 people, uh, covers a little over four square miles. Um, Scotts Valley, I believe, is 400 and just under $500, and Watsonville is just under $600. So you guys are already, already being paid more than Watsonville, which is five times larger. And then also, if you are asking to pay yourself to the 950 mark, that is actually going to be uh, ninety percent more than what Scott the Valley pays themselves. So just keep that in mind. That uh, yeah, the optics are bad, but when you look at it from a percentage standpoint, and that Scotts Valley only has two thousand more people than we do, um, you're already paid more, and that you're asking for uh, to be above them by over ninety percent. So just keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Okay, seeing none, we will bring it back to uh, council. I will just start briefly by saying uh, I have some comments. Should this go into effect, it won't be till next year, so this won't impact me personally anyway because I will be termed out, and so I just want to start by putting that disclaimer out, but I will leave my comments for last and allow uh, my council colleagues to provide any comments they would like to give. Any comments? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. So um, I'm in favor of the proposed compensation. I think it's an equity issue. And I think that the compensation isn't what draws people to this rule. But I think the compensation can be what allows or does not allow people in lower income brackets to take on this role. And I think historically in Capitola, that's what we've seen a lot of. And I'd love to see a more diverse council up here in the future. The current rate that we are being compensated at is less than the California minimum wage. 
of sixteen dollars an hour, and even when we if we do raise it to the nine fifty, that will still be considerably less than the thirty six dollars an hour, which is a living wage in Santa Cruz County according to MIT's living wage calculator. So I don't think it's a lot to ask that city council members are compensated for their time somewhere between minimum wage and a living wage. Thank you. Thank you. Comments? Not yet? Yeah. Okay. No, I, I just want to, again, reiterate to the community because I, we received letters um, about the timeline. And it was when this was brought to FAC, we were still in negotiations at the time with our um, employees, with our, our unions. And so it wasn't brought to light the tax measure or what we were deciding on in regards to the contingencies on that. So I just really want to be clear to the community that this, um, this information was not uh, provided because we hadn't made a decision um, at the time when we met in fact. So I just uh, want to give credit to our current finance advisory committee members and to, to Jim here, who was just providing it based off our, our timeline with, uh, with the city. So thank you. Councilmember Morgan. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just start off by saying when I ran initially for city council, I remember being asked to come in to fill out tax documents, and I was like, for what? And they're like, oh, you get like a stipend. And I was like, oh, OK. So clearly not a reason to get into this position. Um, also, it's not anything that I personally am asking for. It has been a recommendation from the FAC. I am not sitting here asking for $950 a month. Um, so just want to be clear on that. Um, I'm fine with the 5% increase. I'm not looking. I, I do understand the argument of making things more equitable. I think that that has been an issue for this town. Um, and it is clear why some people have continued to serve us um, due to that. But uh, that's obviously not why I'm here. So um, I am not in favor of the immense increase. Councilmember Clark. Yeah, I would like like to also express my concerns of how this looks. Um, I do appreciate what the finance committee has done for us and our finance director, um, but at this point, I don't want to see uh, us get any raise at all, and we should just pass on this. We should pass on it until after our measure has passed. I think once that happens, then we can look at things a little bit differently and maybe come to a, a better, more proportionate uh, scale a scale on the pay but at this time we just have to say no we need to pay our public works and our police department and until we get our measure passed um, that's all we should be thinking about and working on that's where i leave it thank you all right i'll i'll make a couple comments um so as i mentioned this won't apply to me so i don't have any um benefit for this yeah mm -hmm. one way or another but and i can't argue what this job was like previously for previous councils in previous years. I wasn't there. I can't argue um, what the experience was. I can only share my experience after my about to come to the end of my, my eight years. A lot of times being at closed session means you have to leave work early or you need to have childcare. Being on this council, typically you are re essentially required, it's not formally required, but is it expected of you to join different clubs within the community that have dues that you have to pay? We're asked to present proclamations at events that have tickets that cost upwards of $175 or more now. They can get really pricey. Um, these are jobs that I think we do because we want to do them. And it's not that we're doing it for the money, but also this isn't free for us to do this either. It costs money for us to be in these roles, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and again, I can't speak to what this was like for other people in other times, but I'm on 15 different boards, commissions, and committees right now. That's a lot of gas. That's a lot of wear and tear on my car. That's a lot of time away from, there's an opportunity cost to all of these things. And the work that's being done here is work that deserves to be valued. Um, and so I do think that that's an important um, aspect to take into this. I think it's important also, as it was mentioned on the slide, that due to inflation, what 
was being paid to council members in 1977 is equal to more than council members are being paid now when you consider inflation. Um, you know, again, the things that we are asked to do and, and we welcome, I think, are, you know, we are asked to take coffee meetings and lunch meetings with constituents who want to talk to us about things and their ethics rules about who we're allowed to take, you know, who is allowed to pay for our meal or who's allowed to pay for our coffee or how much that can cost. And so these are all things that add up as a council member when we're looking at what it costs to do our job effectively and to represent our city, not just within the city, but out in the community in larger countywide and regional um, events where capital representation is expected. Um, I, I do think that adding an amendment that any council compensation raise will only go to effect into effect contingent on passing of the ballot measure is incredibly um, valid and a smart move. Um, the 5% increase is $33. That would be a $33 increase. And I, I just don't think that that's, I'm sorry. Five five percent per year. Five per year since the last one. So it. No, no, no. I mean, if if tonight we approved just a five percent increase for council, it would be a thirty three dollar increase. Um, and so I think that that's also important that, is that these increases are exponential based on the starting number that you're looking at. And so a five percent increase sounds like a generally good number, but five percent of six hundred and sixty dollars is thirty three dollars. Um, and so I think that that's you know also really really important to consider. I don't disagree about the, the optics and the need to wait for the ballot measure, and so I would definitely um, concur with that. I, I want to ensure that we have a diversity of people who can come and be on this council and not consider, well, I'm not going to be able to afford to get a babysitter or I'm not going to be able to afford to miss the time from work because I'm going to be on boards and commissions that meet at two o'clock in the afternoon or nine o'clock in the morning, and I've got a full-time job that I've got to take off to be in those meetings. And these are all a reality. Um, I also just want to mention that these changes can only go into effect after a new election. And so if, for example, a new council comes on next year, if they decide this change will happen, it won't actually happen until two years after that. It'll have to be after the following election from them. So it's not just because the election happened that that means it can go in effect. It'll mean whatever the next election after that is. So I think that that's also worth, um, worth considering. So those are my comments. Um, we don't have a consensus, it doesn't sound like, but I think for the sake of moving forward with the discussion, we'll entertain a motion and see where we, where we move from there if anyone has a motion to be made. I'll move to approve the new compensation as recommended by FAC contingent on the passage of the new tax measure. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Okay, motion dies for lack of a second. I'll offer my, my comments, um, if that's all right. Okay. Um, I don't, I, I heard from one of our speakers about a tiered approach. And to your point, that's really challenging because of how the funds would or the increase would move from year to year. Um, so that's not necessary. That's unlikely. That's it. Oh, we can't do that. Um, so I'm curious whether council would be open to a middle ground in terms of compensation. One of the things that pre our council made a goal of was to address this regularly bring it to FAC, and we created a process for this. Um, the increase does seem substantial, but again, it's in, it's in alignment with the current SB element OP 29. Um, so I'm curious whether council would find a middle ground to the, the increase contingent on the sales tax measure passing. What's your middle ground? Well, 5% is $33. <laughs> what was our last increase? 10% uh, from 600 to 660. So it was 5% a year for two years. Okay. So 5%. So it still was 5% last time. It was the total, was the total increase of 10% immediately, but it was considered to be a 5% increase 
we can five percent for every two years, we but can an increase by five percent each year that since the last increase. But at the full ten percent goes in once it, once okay. the election's done. That's what I mean. Okay. Yeah. I guess I have a question, um, and if knows the answer, that's fine. But have have we heard from? Other cities is are they voting on this right now as well and like what their ask is and how what increases look like for them for say Scotts Valley or Watsonville? I have not reached out. To okay. Um. So I'm curious what thoughts are since the last increase we did 10 percent. If council would be interested, um, in moving forward with that. That's 66 dollars. Contingent on the sales Contingent tax. on the sales tax. I still say that, that it's not the right time. That's disappointing that if we gave ourselves anything at this time, just because it came to us doesn't mean we have to act and, and see something happen now. I still suggest that we wait until after. Okay, so it sounds like the next time we can act is in 2026. Just want to make that clear with council. 2026. If I could clarify, the council can pass and it can, can increase council compensation whenever it likes. It just would become effective upon the seating of the new council after the next election. So if you wait until 2025 to increase count or to change council compensation, the first council to receive that increased compensation would be 2026 council. 2027 council because there'd be an election in 2026. And so the new council would be in 2027. I think the new council gets seated in December. In December, you're right. So, you're but right. Yep. but yes, for all intents and purposes, that is how it would work. Okay. I mean, I will, I'm not going to be here either way. <laughs> I term out as well. So I'm just thinking about future councils, potential people coming on. It's effective 2027. If that's the consensus with council, because I'm looking at my counterparts here, I'm happy to not move forward with this. I just want it to be very clear that you guys, we understand that. Do we have a motion? I'd like to make a motion that we take no action. Do we have a second? I'll second that. All right. That's interesting timing, I gotta say. All right. Uh, okay. We have a motion in a second. I think for the sake of um, the fact that it sounds like we may or may not have consensus, we might want to have a roll call vote on this one. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Morgan? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? No. Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. And Mayor Brown? No. All right, motion carries uh, three to two. All right, we're gonna move on to our final item, item 9F, city council appointments to city advisory bodies. And this is Julia? It is. Give right. me just one second to pull up the presentation. This one will be brief. So I'm really pleased to share that we started tonight's meeting talking about youth participation in local government, and we are ending on the same note. Um, Tonight, for your review and consideration, there are various appointments to advisory bodies, including two youth member appointments to two different groups, the FAC and the Historical Museum Board. And so really briefly for context, the Historical Museum Board is composed of seven voting members. They serve on three-year terms, and three of the terms expired on June 30th and the city received three applications to fill those terms. In addition, one application was received for a youth ex officio member, so a non-voting member. In addition to that, we also received a youth application for the FAC for an ex officio member. The youth members serve a one-year term, so it's not um, coinciding with the voting members terms. So for your consideration this evening, the recommended action is that the City Council appoint Brian Legakis, Roger Wyant, and Antonia Aldridge to the Museum Board for terms ending on June 30th, 2027, and then appoint two youth ex officio non-voting members, one to the Museum Board and one to the FAC. Their names are listed on the screen. I'm available for any questions. All right, thank you. Any questions? Questions? No questions. All right, do we have any public comment on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council. And we will have discussion or... Uh... 
I am happy to make a motion to appoint the members of the public and youth ex officio members to the City of Capitola Historical Museum Board and appoint a youth ex, ex no. officio member to the Finance Advisory Committee. I will second that. All right. We have a motion and a second. I think we can do a voice, voice vote on this one. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. All right, that brings us to the end of our meeting tonight. Our next regularly scheduled city council meeting is on August 22nd at 6 p.m. We'll see you in a month. Take care.